is a huge honour to be interviewing the extremely distinguished economist, Danny Blanchflower, who I have looked up to for a very long time. I've interviewed him for my books. So, you know, that's... I think that's a recommendation, Danny, if you don't mind me saying so. Yeah. More importantly, though, more importantly, though, he's currently a tenured economics professor at Dartmouth College, um, which is obviously over in New Hampshire. He's got a beautiful lake behind him where he is, but we can't show it for aesthetic, for camera reasons. It, I'm sure it looks great. Also, very interesting, used to be a member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, which sets the interest rates and so on. Bit of a rare voice um, in terms of the economic orthodoxy which has prevailed there, which is, I would argue, part of, part of the reason this country is in quite a lot of a mess. We could have had more Dannys and could still have more Dannys there, unfortunately. But there we have it. Now... The one big reason I want to talk to Danny right now is before the election, he endorsed Labour as part of a letter. It wasn't just him. There was lots of distinguished economists who did. Um, and he has, let's I think, renounced it. Let's just put it that way. And I want to talk to you about that, but more broadly, the current government, we want to hold the government to account, their economic strategy, and the actual credible alternative. So I think that's what we'll do. How are you doing? Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I just, uh, it's good to see you again. It's great to um, see you as well. I mean, the story in many ways was that you had 14 years of Tory rule and basically it was time to get rid of them. <laughs> I mean, the first, in a way, in a way, I don't regret the, the, in a way what I said, because in the first hour, they scrapped Rwandan concentration camps. And, and that seemed pretty important. But I had hope that a Labour government would actually try to start to put people first and try to think about things like millions of people on wait lists, people struggling, people struggling to get appointments with doctors, schools in trouble, potholes, local authorities struggling with social care. And I thought, you know, and, the, and basically high levels of poverty and particularly child poverty, that seemed to me at least an opportunity for change. I, I guess, so let me, let me ask just so yeah. we can set the scene a bit better. And, and yeah. I do this, by the way, because the left is often accused of looking for traitors, not converts, and I'm not doing that. But I'm interested in the mechanics of this. So the letter was entitled Labour is offering a credible plan to address Britain's economic uh, problems. I just, firstly, I mean, lots of economists were on this. Lots of economists I look up to. And I should say that people, again, who I've interviewed, people like the brilliant Professor Mariana Mazzucato, for example, Joe Stiglitz, of course, Simon Ren Lewis over at Oxford. Um, I mean, you you know, a huge, I mean, this is kind of like progressive economists you want on your side if you want an alternative. So, you know, if we're going to start condemning everyone now as, as, as ah, look what you did, you know, that wouldn't be very useful from my perspective. Can I just ask, how did the letter come about? Who did, how were you approached? Oh, if I recall, John Van Rienen, who's an extremely distinguished professor I've known for many a moon, who went to America and actually came back to, to England, has got a great London accent, as John, um, asked me to sign it. And I kind of thought, well... I mean, perhaps perhaps it was mistaken. I don't know. I mean, I'm I, I sort of have reversed myself, but I felt at the time, um, and I had been opposed what the Tories had done. Really, I mean, I was probably the most outspoken opponent of austerity in 2010. So, in a sense, that was my continuation of that. I mean, I called Slasher Osborne in 2010, and I and I was vehemently against it then, and I've been vehemently against as you as you known for many a moon, and I thought at least. At least it, it had some hope. I had some hope that people with at least a heart and a soul and a and a concern about the well-being of ordinary people mm. um, would 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 try and change things. And I sort of hoped you've not you've not met the leader's office then. <laughs> <laughs> no. I sort of hoped that um, work was being done in the background. And I'll give you an example. And I'm writing about it in a column next week. I mean, if you recall, in 1997, Blair gets elected on the 1st of May. And on the 7th of May, Gordon Brown and Ed Balls announced they've done lots of work and they're going to make the Bank of England independent, which was probably a smart move at the time. And it lowered the cost of borrowing to the British people. It actually made people better off. And it turned out that they'd done all this work and they prepared themselves. And basically, I was hoping that maybe false hope that ultimately work had been done on trying to think about alternatives that really helped people. I had a lot of hope and I had not really expected to hear what I had heard, what I've heard. And it was clear to me very quickly. And despite the fact that many of us tried to offer sensible alternatives, that the Starmer speech and Reeves speeches suggested to me, they learned nothing, they hadn't prepared, they were simply going to revert back 
to the failed orthodoxy. And I was not going to stand for that. And so I've, you know, I mean, I guess I'm standing up saying, well, I signed that letter. Perhaps I shouldn't have signed it. I had some hope. But here I am. Here I am. I'm standing up with my pal, Richard Murphy. And we called ourselves the Mile End Road Economist. And you probably Before have to explain why. Before I come to my lead, the last thing I just want to ask about this letter, because I do want to talk to you yeah. about because you're such an invaluable voice. Like we need you desperately, and we need Richard Murphy. Right. We need you to come up with the actual alternative. This country desperately needs this mess. I suppose just on this though, in terms of what I, I guess it's about these letters and why they happen. And it, it goes on about the various questions in the economy that need to be rectified. And it concludes, contrary to what the government has been saying, we believe that Labour provides a credible economic alternative get across all these dimensions. And that Keir Starmer and Rachel Rees offer a combination of stability and an ambitious set of reforms to help grow the economy. I guess, look, I'm not an economist, obviously. My, I quit the Labour Party a few months before that election. I, I joined the Labour Party at the age of 15, and I'm now 40, unfortunately. I'm a geriatric no, millennial. Oh, good Lord. Four zero, I'm afraid. Geriatric millennial. That's I'm a that's older the, than you. These, there are a lot of disturbing facts will be spitting in this interview. <laughs> in any case, um, you know, and I did, and I voted for Labour, on, you know, under every Labour leader in my lifetime. And the reason I didn't this time, for various reasons, one of them was I believe the country was in a mess and they didn't have an economic alternative, and that was likely to cause more insecurity, and misery, but also more turmoil. I, I think a lot of the turmoil this country's had it comes down to that. I guess what my frustration is, is basically, did these economists, you yourself included, basically, was it just a wing and a prayer? Kind of something well, might come up. With high, well, I, the, at the time, I probably would have said no. I mean, I think we had we had a degree of hope. I mean, not least that um, the distribution of income and wealth seemed to have become distorted. And there was certainly some hope that a Keir Starmer would have some compassion. The view to immigration seemed kinder. And it seemed to me, in some sense, that we had, you know, e economics of the heart, that we might at least try and put people first. I mean, I always think back, I'm a big fan of Gordon Brown. I have forever. I've known him pretty well. I think he's a very smart man. And if you look back, the thing, and he's written so much about it recently, he has in his heart that child poverty is something that really upsets and hurts him. And he wants to do things about children. He wants to do things about education. He cares about the world. And the sense that I was a caring man who's trying to do the best that he can. Um, there's been varying issues, but I, I'm a huge fan of his. Um, and I think I think you know he's he he comes he he's a politician with a heart, and that's always appealed to me. And and he's come and taught my class at Dartmouth, and he and I have sat down and talked. And you know that's what I think a, a good social democrat should be about. You can have nuances and critiques of him. But ultimately, ultimately, if you said to, if you said to him, "What do you think the thing that you were most known for?" I think he would probably say that I reduced child poverty. Well, yup de yup. I'm, well, I'm glad I'm glad you raised Gordon Brown because that's actually a really really important point. I think because look, whatever my disagreements with Gordon Brown, I would never doubt that he he's genuinely... an honest, caring guy. You know, well, and I... okay, he, he didn't like he got in trouble because he said something about some lady in Rochdale. He doesn't he doesn't have the he's not a glad hander. He doesn't no, but have, no, the point I make is in front I, of your class, and you're, he's unbelievable. I mean, to talk, but to I never, guy, he's great. I never doubt that Gordon Brown genuinely believes in reducing child poverty. Whatever I think about, maybe you know, right. more being more ambitious. That, that's what I'm making. I suppose the question and, I and he understands you, markets too. He does understand markets. I mean, he but, does but understand with, the move to the Bank of England was a really good move. But but the point about Keir Starmer, this is what I wanted to put to you because you mentioned child poverty. A long time before the general election, a year before the general election, Keir Starmer went on the BBC and he said to Laura Connersberg that he wasn't going to scrap the two-child limit, which is the single biggest generator of child poverty well, in Britain. I, I, I understand that, and he's going to have to do it. Um, he said he's not going to. I mean, I mean, I mean, I can put, up, put my hat and say, well, I probably shouldn't have signed that thing. Okay. I probably I had some hopes. Um, let's talk about where we are. I mean, yes, I'm, sorry, yeah. I mean, how many people stand up and go, well, I was mistaken. Let's go. And that's where I am, right? Let's go. And here's what where made we are. you realize trying to what, go. What made you realize? Let's talk about now. Because well, you you've written some really damning and very admirably damning critiques. You said basically, and this is what you said, you said, prove me wrong, but Labour have no clear economic ideas at all. They well, have no I vision. Mean, I mean, the things that I have heard. We we're in a twenty billion dollar hole we didn't know existed. Really? Oh, okay. Well, you should have read the documents. 
Um, and we have to go and, I mean, I understand, Re Re Reeves talked about basically restoring austerity. And what I've heard, cuts coming to government departments, and I've heard the big issues is going to be on local authorities. Well, if local authorities are going to cut again, why? Why would you do that? There's no, I mean, I'm an economist. There is absolutely no economic necessity of any kind to do that. You're an economically naive fool if you say that. There is no need whatsoever when you have a government that has its own central bank and currency. Think back simply. So you get COVID and you say, oh, actually, we can't do anything for furlough schemes and all of that because it's going to cost us money. Oh, we've been invaded or there's been an earthquake and we can't do it because we haven't got any money. Well, actually, you do do it. And what do you do? Well, you borrow. I live in the United States. No one in the United States ever talks about fiscal rules. Nobody ever talks about this stuff saying, well, we can't afford to do it. Well, there's arguments about it. Well, ta Trump actually instigated a $2 trillion tax cut that had raised the deficit essentially by $2 trillion. Well, okay. So the question is, what are your priorities? Can the government fund things? Can it borrow? Can it... To, um, change its priorities? And the answer is indubitably, it can. And every time in the past, and I have a column coming out in The Guardian next week, talks about the fact that, oh, well, we had the gold standard and everyone said we have to stick by the gold standard, even though it's terrible. And then we scrapped it and somebody said, well, we never actually realized we could scrap it. Yeah. Well, of course you could scrap it. That was and a Labour minister. Said, that was a Labour minister, wasn't it? It was the yeah, national, yeah, yeah. it was the Labour government of 1991. Clem, Clem Attlee yeah. comes in and it's, and it's austere times and you say, well, what are we going to do? Well, obviously, there's still food rationing. So we know that there's an issue. But what does he do? He says, well, I've, I've read what William Beveridge said. William Beveridge talks about the importance of work, people coming back from the war, P women who've been in the factories coming back. We're going to create a world that they can come back to live in. So we create the welfare state and we build houses and we nationalize 20 percent of the of the nation's industries. And well, what do we end up? Unemployment rates are really, really low. And in 1950, it gets re-elected. So that's a historic perspective. But then let's go back to what happened in 2010. The claim in 2010, which is more or less is being repeated by Rachel Reeves, was shown to be entirely in error. Every justification for it was in error. Um, and it was, it was basically around a paper by Reinhardt and Rogoff. And I can tell you the story if you'd like me to tell it. Um, where the, and, and Osborne talked about it in his, in his May's lecture, he talked about it in his lecture to the Conservative um, Conference, talked about the importance of not allowing debt to GDP ratios to rise. Well, turns out that the best you could say it was an error, literally a complete and total fraud error, not true. And what happened, he basically said, was that countries that had high debt to GDP ratios of over 90% had very low growth rates. Yeah. Un untrue, completely untrue. And so the prediction was that if you cut debt to GDP ratios, the economy slows, which is exactly what Rachel Reeves is trying to do. And the evidence was basically this very important to us. After the Second World War, countries like Atlee did in New Zealand and other places, they took on debt, they invested, so the debt to GDP ratios rose. But what happened? The economies grew. They grew. They didn't shrink. They grew. So the precedent historically was that the prediction, prediction made by Osborne and others, the economy is going to grow. Well, actually, it didn't. Flatline, the growth of the economy that was happening then collapsed. So now what we have is basically Reeves and Starmer telling us that we need to do austerity again. Well, didn't they notice? Didn't they listen? We didn't Let need to oh, kind, of, kind of put the devil's advocate of Rachel. Rachel Reason, Keir Starmer clearly not in this conversation. But if they were, they would say to you, look, we had Liz Truss. She tried doing uncosted policies and look what happened. The well, economy agreed. tanked, agreed. mortgages went up. Agreed. So you do it in a credible, sensible way and you try and think about, I mean, I love this, I love this conversation that we should think about debt. Well, okay, why think about a let's go to a firm. I mean, let's try and think of a firm. Mm -hmm. Take, I don't know, some British, large British firm. Does anybody ever say, oh, look, that firm's got debt? No. What they say is, well, what are they using the debt for? Right? So you say, okay, I've borrowed $20 million to build a ship. And at the end of the time, when the ship's built, we'll get 50 million back. The question is, what are you going to spend that debt on? 
right? You're not, I mean, so what it trusts you, she wants to use this tax cuts to her friends. Well, if you say, I'm going to take this money and I'm going to invest it in the British people, I'm going to invest it in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I'm going to invest it in, I don't know, improving productivity. So, so, so I think if you, if you make people healthier, they're more productive. I've been the big issue in the UK is why is productivity so low? The French do in four days what the Brits do in five. So you start to try and invest in training and invest in things that will improve the way the economy works. Think of all the people who've left the labor force. They, 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 they struggle to, opt to, to, to work in that, in that labor market. So what you do is you invest in healthcare, you invest in schools and training and roads and water and various things, bridges, airports, so that you, let's think of it this way, you can borrow at five and invest in projects that pay more than five. So that's not what Trust did. Trust wanted to blow it on a some kind of wild party. But she also, and I wrote, I wrote a whole series of columns telling her exactly what was going to come if she did that. I wrote a column in August before she came into office. And I said, she has to go from Mrs. Stupid to Mrs. Sensible in, in the first hour because the bond markets, the foreign exchange markets, the capital markets and so on will, will, will collapse around it. And she'll have to listen to Tom Scholar. And she fired Tom Scholar. So you do it in a credible way. You think about where you're going to borrow it from and what you're going to spend it on. Um, and you're going to invest in the future of the country. You don't go on a wild party as trust plan to do. And you certainly put these plans through credible places. You go to the Bank of England. I mean, just one last thing. So I gave a big speech last year to the British Pensions Association. And I talked about this and I said to them the week before trust was going to um, do these schemes, did she ever come and talk to your association or any of you about what the effects would be on the pensions scheme? And they said, no. And I said, so what would you have told her? Um, what would have happened about what she was going to do? And they said, well, we told her that we would have told her that probably it would have taken a day and the, and the pension sector in the UK would have collapsed. And I said, well, how did you do? And they said, it took two hours. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the answer was, you know, you go and you consult and you think about the right way to do things. How long will you borrow for? How would you get this money? What would you do with it? You have a credible economic strategy where you consult with the markets and the markets clearly um, can understand that you are prepared to borrow and invest. Invest in the country's future, invest in growth and invest in the well-being of the people. So if Keir Starmer was going to mount a defence here, he'd say, we're doing that. We're taking on the planning rule system and we're going to build a load of houses and that's a solution what would you say to that um well that might that might have an effect in five years time but these things take an awfully long time I and mean, the reason in a way that i have responded in the way i had was that i had hoped on day one they were going to start announcing things right because in economics what we learn is there are time lags right there's a time mm. lag between you recognize the problem you think of a fix you say, OK, I'm going to have this fix and I've got the, I mean, think of Brown and Balls. They had the Bank of England Act ready to go. It was implemented in 1998. But you set this thing up, you set it in train. And even when you set the policies go, it takes a while to have an effect. So even, so A, too little, and it'll clearly be too late. What are you going to do? For example, today, I mean, I've been writing today, the, um, uh, there's evidence today about the huge problem of the of well-being of the young declining, well-being of the young, very, very poor levels of mental health of 15-year-olds yeah. out, yeah. out, out, out today. The what, worst are gonna do about? Yeah. what are you going to do about 7 million people on wait lists? Well, I would have said, if it was me, I'd have come up and said, okay, 7 million people on the wait list. Here's my plan. My plan, to, I'm going to try and get them down, let's say, 300,000 a month. I don't know. Some. Here's my plan. We'll implement it today and we'll start going. So if you think you're going to sit, try and get that wait list down, well, where's Keir Starmer? It, it, even if he announces something today, nothing's going to happen for two years. So why aren't you? Why weren't you ready to go? Why weren't you ready to go? Maybe you were ready to go on Rwanda. Maybe you were ready to go on. I don't know. Certainly wasn't ready to go on whether he's going to have a, a, a scheme to help the young come to the country. So that was the one thing. And then the other thing, of course, we have to keep thinking about is Brexit which acts as a huge, it's the most biggest economic suicide note ever written by a country ever. There's a fiscal rule that Rachel Reese has stuck to. Just made it up. There is no such thing in economics as fiscal rules, by the way. Okay, okay. Well, I'll no just other country in the world has them. I see no okay, well, that's good. Them. Well, I'll explain what it is, and you can also explain that part as well. Well, basically, her fiscal rule, which she's maintained from the Tories, is that debt must start falling in five years as a percentage of GDP, mm -hmm. i.e. the economy, 
What do you think? Okay, so that's interesting. Why would I bother with that, given that I know that debt, there is no basis for such a rule in economics? That's just made up. Um, why not 27 years or 52 years or 20 minutes? It's, it's just literally a made up, non existent rule, has no basis in economics whatsoever. And also knowing that higher debt to GDP ratios are actually good for growth. So why, why do you want that? I see, there is no economic basis for that. It's just made up nonsense. It really is. I mean, I live in America. No one in America has ever heard of such a fiscal rule. I tried to write about it quite often in the past, but this is completely unnecessary and shows no real understanding of how the economics operates. There is no such rule in economics. There's no, no necessity for that. I mean, supposing you had, imagine that we went in, 90, in, tw in 2019 and you said, I got this fiscal rule and we're gonna do this. Well, how, how did it manage when COVID came along? How did it manage when there were supply shocks to the economy? How did it manage when there was a war in Ukraine and that raised oil prices? I mean, it's laughable. It's laughable. That, I mean, so now you can strain yourself about the possibility of what will happen in five years' time, but it never happens in five years' time. So I think that's, that's just, I'm, I'm afraid it's just not, you see, no sensible economist ever justified it. So I just think people should just sort of ignore it and say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. I'm interested in terms of what you think the consequences of this will be economically in terms of their plans as they stand. And what we're talking about is, she's already briefing, departments getting real terms cuts. And bear in mind, we've had now austerity for 14 years, um, which we've had the longest squeeze in wages now since the Battle of Waterloo. The Resolution Foundation last year found yeah. that 15 years of economic stagnation left the average British worker £11,000 a year worse off than if the their increase in wages had continued at the same rate as the financial crash. So it was like social progress in Britain just stopped. Well, but that's a choice. So what does this mean? Not a necessity. I mean, you've written a lot about it, and the, and the claim against this stuff is that you have, we had to do this. The markets were demanding this. Not true. That was simply not true. That was the necessity. There was no necessity to impose austerity. I mean, let, let's just go back to the gold. I love this. My friend Doug Irwin is the great expert on this, and Barry uh, Barry Eichengreen has written on this. Mm -hmm. The way to think of that: go back to the gold standard. There's three rules there. If you didn't have it, you did the best. The sooner you got off it, the better you did, and the longer you left it on, the worse you were off. You were. Well, austerity is much like that. The ones you didn't impose it, people did best. The United States did much better. Didn't impose it. The quicker you stopped it, the better you did. And if you repeated it, I mean, it's like it's like saying um, um, the best way for a runner to run faster is to amputate his leg. I mean, it's as ridiculous as that. There is no economic necessity to impose austerity. Uh, I'm, and the reality is that the austerity is just another way of saying, I mean, you could be very harsh. And I've been criticized. I remember Ian Dale went mad at me when I said this. I said the whole purpose of austerity is to kill poor people. Oof. Well, I mean, there's some truth to that. I mean, what well, do you do? You, by the way, there's there is some truth to it. Excess. I think it's a terrible thing to say, but you yeah. lower life expectancy of the poor. You take away the you take away the safety barriers. You don't let them get to appointments to doctors. You give you don't don't give them money for heating in their homes. You don't you don't give them social centers to go to. And in fact, if you think of COVID, you packed them into cheap places where they weren't protected from COVID, and you made them more vulnerable. So austerity, A, you know, certainly did have a very big impact on poor people. And of course, it also had an impact on Brexit. And it brought about lots of the suffering that people blamed on you know, Polish plumbers, whatever. But basically, it's Osborne generated this thing. And then he ends up being the editor of the Evening Standard, where I know of, yeah, of the independent, it was at the, at the independent and other, I mean. Yeah, yeah was he, he, was at the, he was at the Evening Standard's editor. Yeah, that's right. But you, I mean, um, but the, and then went to the went to be at the the, um, the British Museum and other things. I mean, this I think so. This is a choice. I mean, this is a choice. This is a choice that the that the that the Austerians chose because they wanted to, if you like, diminish the power of workers, reduce their bargaining powers, frighten them into frighten them into um, you know being compliant. So that then resources could be moved from the poor to the rich, and you see a balance of a balance being shifted from the poor to the rich, and then you say, "But we've got to do this again because there's a right. danger that people's wages will rise." So think about what's been happening. So, so as soon as you start to see wages rising, and people starting to respond and starting to think and see a hope of bringing in a labour government, what you say is, right. "Now we've got to go to austerity again." Think about what this is going to do to social care. 
Well, what it's going to do to teach us, I mean, I'm very mindful. So think of this, the story about, here's a good example, the story about the declining well-being of the young, which I've written a lot about and I'm going to write a lot about now. Think about what's happening. 15-year-olds in schools are depressed and struggling. What about teachers? Think about the effects of all of this on teachers. I'm very mindful that teaching in schools is now very, very difficult. Teachers are struggling. Their, 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 their well-being is a really big deal. How can we deliver high-quality education if our students are depressed? You can't hire teachers. I mean, they've been telling around the world, telling teachers what books they can use and what they can do. Well, how, how, is, how is that helpful? Made, it, hmm. made, it made those, that austerity made Britain and the British people more vulnerable to a COVID shock, and it's made them more vulnerable to a shock from oil prices. So what you need to do in a country is you need to build the country's resources up, build it up its reserve, raise productivity, and protect the people so that when a shock comes along, they're less vulnerable. And I don't really care whether the rich can buy themselves bigger and bigger and bigger yachts. Sorry. Just further on to a point, I mean, two various academic studies have estimated that between 190,000 and 300,000, there were three, the excess deaths that is because right. of austerity. Now, well, there's a very... Michael, Mar Michael Marmot has talked a great deal about how austerity has lowered the health of the nation and how it's lowered the health of the most vulnerable. So if you are a Labour government and you have a heart, which is what I always hope, I say Gordon Brown has. Good luck. I mean, we haven't talked about this yet, and I want to talk about it now. So Richard Murphy and I have started up what's called the Mile End Road Economists. Uh, I want to explain what that is, and I'm going to try and make a third person join it. You may not think of yourself as an economist, but he's a sympathetic advisor called Owen Joe. Let me tell Hi. you why. I want you Hi. to see, uh, put your hand up if you think. So what do we, so my, my old professor, Bernard Corey, Dan Corey, well, people know of him, who's my old supervisor, Morris Peston, um, and Robert Peston's dad, used to uh, taught me on the Mile End Road. They say to me, Danny, the thing we have to do as economists is care about the well-being of the man on the, on the Clapham omnibus. But that's changed. Dan Corey told me it's changed because he apparently used to live in Clapham. And he said, Clapham's kind of rich now. You've got to change it. Your so piece. I, I like the Mile End Roads where Queen Mary is. Why is it called the Mile End Road? Well, it turns out, I think in 1341, it was the site of the Peasant Rebellion, right? It was a mm -hmm. kind of rebellious place. But what's it a mile from? The Mile End Road. It's got the White Chapel on one end, the White Chapel Hospital where my daughter was born, and the Mile End Road, the road out of London. And it's a mile from where? It's a mile from Aldgate. It's a mile from the Bank of England. It's a mile from the city of London. So it's relevant to think about what is the woman, because I don't want to do the man, I want to do the woman. What is the woman who's got on the bus on the Mile End Road? She's headed out of London. How is she doing compared to the city banker's bonus of Barclays in the city who's just gone up from whatever to whatever? What, what is the government thinking about her? It's her time. What are we doing about her? So would you like to join? What do you think of this? This is about the well-being of the woman on the Mile End Road omnibus. For goodness sake. Sign me up. And, You're and, up. You signed up. And not just me signed up, but according to Bloomberg, let me just read this out because this is obviously music to your ears and Chris to the mill. This is an article on Bloomberg. The UK's fiscal watchdog laid out the case for new Chancellor Rachel Rees to embark on a public investment splurge amid concern she risks hurting growth with an overly cautious budget. The Office for Budget Responsibility said most benefits from high investment arrived long after the five-year period that's capped by its forecast by the government's yep. self-imposed fiscal rules and goes on to make the case for an investment boost equal to 1% of GDP could raise the economy's potential output by just over 0. under 0.5%. So it goes on to make that point. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we're talking here, this in terms of what they're arguing would obviously benefit the woman on the bus in my land. Well, uh, but even this in Bloomberg.com, I'm reading, not a den of leftiness, no, it must be no. said. That's to put, and, and she's talking about the Office for Budget Responsibility set up by George Osborne, no less, yes. making this argument for public investment. The argument for public investment, I mean, the first argument that I'm trying to make is that you shouldn't cut public investment, right? I mean, remember what Osborne did? Is that he decided that he would not raise taxes but that he would cut spending. Mm -hmm. That was a choice. So the first thing, even if Rachel decided, I mean, if I agreed that you need to have fill of some fiscal hole, you could literally do that by not cutting spending at all. You could. What could you do? 
Well, guess what? You could raise taxes. You could, I mean, you could, I'm not saying you should, but you literally could raise taxes to fill that hole. And that would protect the woman on the Mile End Road omnibus who, you know, is struggling and perhaps gets benefits and all that stuff, can't get a job because you've got two kids and can't afford childcare and all of that. But you literally could choose to do that. So cutting public spending and telling departments to cut spending on social care and childcare is a choice. So the first one is, I would say, well, if you want to do that fiscal rule, go, go, go raise taxes, raise taxes. You made a start on, on private schools, but go and raise taxes on the ones you've benefited the most over the last 14 years. Go do that. So the first thing I'm saying is you shouldn't cut spending, right? That's the first part. And then secondly, I'm saying, well, probably you should raise it because raising it will actually boost the economy as Bloomberg is talking about. So it's not cut spending, it's keep spending where it is and raise it. That would be potentially. But the other one, if you really want to go down the road of saying we need to rebalance things, then it's a significant argument to raise taxes. So, Rachel, oh, no, can you explain why are you doing that? Which, so just explain which specific taxes would you raise and well, which would your priorities be for spending? Well, my priorities have to be the NHS. They have to, the NHS seems, I mean, it's on its knees. Yeah. I mean, the story is, I mean, I'm in America. I, I mean, I need to go see a doctor. I go see the doctor tomorrow. And yeah. see it's, a, it's a mess. It's a mess. It's a mess. It's a complete yeah. mess. I would, I mean, I've talked to GPs. Go and hire more GPs. Go and hire more dentists. Go try and get this wait list out. Start to build more hospitals. Put funding in there. Tomorrow, let's try and do this thing. Let's try and get the health service working. Why do you think there are so many disabled people? Well, there's disabled people because this person was ill, couldn't get to see a doctor. Mm -hmm. Now they're even more ill and they're waiting for a doctor and they're too ill to go to work. So now they're disabled. Well, British productivity and output has declined because of it. So the first thing is, that's, I mean, Michael Marmot is the king of all this. He's wonderful. And he talks about we need to invest in the health and well-being of our people. And the latest evidence is that actually we have a generation of young people, particularly young women, who are now in severe mental health problems. Um, I've got a paper coming out on Monday talks about despair and depression amongst these young people. Well, presumably it's because there's under provision of mental health help. P kids apparently, but doctors are... Doctors are trying to say, let's give them mental health help. None is available. Funding's cut. Well, that's not good. How are these kids going to make a successful transition from school to work? How are they going to set up households and be successful as families and then start to pay taxes? This is condemning a generation, a generation brought up on austerity and brought up through COVID and now are struggling. So you need to invest. It's like, a, it's like an economic and social war. Think of this as a social war. You need to invest and try and think about and, and have a national thought. Think about mm. what's the best thing for us to do. There are potholes in the roads. We've just had riots. Well, riots, I don't know who could talk about why, but these are social questions. These are, if a society is broken, I mean, I think it's austerity broke Britain. So yeah. if a country's broken, you need to go mend it. If a country's so been attacked by war, you mend it. They need to right, go right. And mend it. And the rich probably have benefited hugely. I mean, let's just think about the water companies. So water, yeah. there's an example. You know, you've got to fix water. What have they done? The rivers are polluted. The lakes are polluted. The beaches are polluted. You privatize this thing. The, the, te the, the people took themselves big pay increases. They paid themselves dividends. And now what's the, what is Labour going to do? Well, go and nationalize it do whatever you can and tomorrow go and say now we're going to clean the water up we're going to invest in it we're going to well it's just, it's just been revealed that Th thames waters lobbied the government to intervene with the regulator to allow it to charge far higher bills and i know i know well that makes no sense Arguing against I've nationalization seen, I mean, surely as well. i've seen the pictures of the have you seen the channel the pictures yeah. of the french coast and then the british coast with sort of yeah. sewage well it's a party of sewage well why on day one have labor not got a not got a fix well i don't know care what it is my view would be you should just step in and say, right, we're going to take it, and that's the end of it. And now what we're going to do is we're going to build reservoirs, and we're going to have a you know, national commission, and we're going to start things going. And our priority is to clean the water. Right. Let's go clean the water for the people. That's what they did in Paris. They, they brought water to public ownership and then start. This was ridiculed in Britain when people boiled this out. But they have um, they created um, um, taps with sparkling water in the streets, which people can use. Just, I mean, I mean, Rachel, I mean yeah, but that's what they do in India. That's what they do in less developed countries. Hmm. I mean, that's not, I mean, I, I live in America in a very rural place. And obviously in many other places, I mean, I have a well, 
Um, but but we don't we build we don't have anything anywhere near as much rain as the UK has. The UK has lots of nice <laughs> nice rain. I mean, it's an absolute disgrace. My priority, if I'd have been Starm, was to say we're just going to clean the water up. This, what do we need to do here? And, and what I would have done actually is I would have commissioned half a dozen studies and all the experts and said, "How do I do this? How, here's six papers. How do I do this? Right, everybody. Now let's decide what we're going to do. And now today, let's implement something." But he's so, done nothing, so that's going to happen for eighteen months, whatever he does. So, so this is we, in we the we talked about the need to invest, and we've got yeah. Bloomberg and the Office for Budget Responsibility on side, let alone me. But, um, I mean, why do you think Rachel Rees and Keir Starmer are, other than, I mean, they will probably do something around capital gains, which will be welcome, and inheritance tax, but nowhere near right. enough. Just right. nowhere right. near. Because at the moment, just to stand still, you need to raise a certain right. amount Absolutely. of money. And standing still is after Absolutely. 14 years of austerity. So you actually, absolutely. what you need to do is reverse the damage of austerity. Which no, means absolutely. No, Why right. are they so reluctant, do you think, to do that? Because I suppose their view would be, we if you do this, then the rich will all leave and, and so on. That's the argument they would put. Um, I think the answer is groupthink. I'm going to tell you an, an, another story about Gordon Brown. So for a <laughs> long time, I get on the MPC. And from October 2007, I start to vote on my own because I say the Great Recession's coming and this looks absolutely terrible. And everybody else says, Blanche, you're an idiot, <laughs> literally. And they vote against me <laughs> for many, many, many months. And then later when they when it all turned out I was right, they say things like, oh, it was Danny's fault he didn't persuade us or it wouldn't have made any <laughs> difference or you know, some kind of nonsense. But anyway, so around June, July 2008, and I had voted endlessly one to eight, right? So Gordon Brown calls me up and he says, Danny, um, I just want to tell you something. I just want to tell you that I think you're right. I go, oh, it's good when the prime minister, it was prime minister, calls you up mm -hmm. and says, I think you're right. right. I go, great. And he says, I want to say something to you to make you sort of think about this. He said, I know you're losing eight to one and you sort of think there's eight views and yours. He said, there isn't, there's two views. Was theirs and yours, and they're wrong. I always remember that. And so the answer is that the eight people all thought the same together, and they all fed off one another as they did under the as they did in the gold standard. Yeah. Um, and they did at the Bank of England, right? I mean, yeah. even even in September, even the failure of Lehman Brothers in September two thousand eight, that my colleagues had no idea, despite the fact that I'd given a speech saying it and done it endlessly, they had no idea at all that the US had gone into recession in December of the year before, and the UK and every other European country had gone into recession in April 2008. So this was basically, the in, in the end, the, the failure of Lehman's and, in, and eventually the failure of RBS. So nine months, essentially, after everything had happened, they still had no clue. So that was the, the bright, great minds, the Oxbridge crew, who did really well, and they all lived in London, and they, whatever, right? So there's the group think. And now we have the same thing. We have group think that austerity was great. It's the same we in the British think, media. It's the same what? in the British media. Say that again? It's the same in the British media. No, no, absolutely. And of course, yeah. of course. So what you have is this group think. Um, and, and in a way, the economics is pretty interesting. This may, I always thought this, about what, what do the markets say and what do the markets think? This may set you going. So there's four possibilities, right? Here's you. So me, I'm a broker. I'm a media person. Who, what's the possibility? The first is that I'm right and everybody else is right. So that's okay. Second possibility is I'm wrong and everybody else is wrong, but that's okay too. Another possibility is that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. Well, that's okay. Not bad, I get some credit for a day or two. The fourth possibility is that I'm wrong and everybody else is right. The possibility of that is so bad that nobody will put themselves in the position of breaking from the pack. So they're all happy to be in yeah. the pack and wrong. That's the point. If there is no, I mean, think in the media, think of politicians. If you keep driving say, over the cliff, right, yeah, that's, okay. that's where we are. And yeah. so the way the political system is set up, the newspapers are set up and so on. I mean, I remember me being, I mean, my daughter called me up. She was at St. Andrews University at the time when I was at the bank. And she called me up and she said, she was upset. She said, I saw in the paper, Daddy, that somebody wrote, you were an idiot without a village. Charles Goodhart, who has never apologized to me, 
said basically Blanchfeld's an idiot. No one ever listens to him. There is no possibility that there's a recession. Really? He should have stuck to sheep farming. <laughs> Blimey. Seriously, I mean, this is like September wow. 2008, and these, and then wow. they still talk to him about stuff. Like, really, you have in September well, 2000, he said I was an idiot because I said there was a recession, and there was. I'm still well, waiting for him to call me up and apologize. And until that point, he should stick to sheep farming. Well, at least there was no <laughs> lasting. At least there was no lasting disastrous consequences from all. No, of no, there was terrible consequences of it. Oh, yeah. I, I was being, so, I was being, so, I was being sarcastic. Just to be clear, just to be clear. Can't no, one last thing. So think okay. about where we are with Rachel and, and Keir Starmer. The, the way to do economics is actually, and I say it to my students all the time, think about what the consequences are if you're right. So their consequences are, we've got this black hole, we've got to deal with it, and the market will sort this all out and it will be fine on the night. Well, what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong and the woman on the Mile End Road omnibus now is in a hospital, can't look after her kids, she's struggling, she can't eat, she can't heat herself. What if what if what, what Owen Jones and Danny Blanchard have been saying is true? They that is really really scary, and I want to scare Rachel Reese senseless into a really imagining the consequences of what she's going to do and the potential downside risk to it, with the hope that a she won't implement it, and b if she does, the second the data starts to turn in the direction I'm sure it's going to go, that she does the fastest handbrake U-turn we've ever seen. Well, ju just finally, that's my final question, really. What do we do about this? Because as things stand, they are determined to stick right. to this path. They're being very, very clear that they are going to make what they call tough decisions. And these tough decisions are always made by the sorts of people, for example, the women on the bus in on the Mile End Road, tough decisions made by other people. Or there's this Labour poster, one of my favourite Labour posters of all time. It's from 1929. Um, and it is uh, entitled, it's something along the lines of everyone makes a sacrifice. Um, it has three men, four men on a ladder. Um, let me find it. it has, yeah, here we go. Equality of sacrifice, question mark. It has a rich man on £10,000 a year, a lot of money at the time, big fat portly guy. He's at the top of the ladder. Uh, just below him is a thousand pound man. Below that, a two hundred and fifty pound a year man. And below that, the unemployed man. He's just above water. His head's just above the water line. The ladder's going into the water, and the uh, the man at the top has a brilliant idea. The equality of sacrifice. That's the big idea, friends. Let's all step down one rung. Now they're all on the ladder. If they all take a one step down, then the, the unemployed guy, right. man drowns, and the Mon, mon man and is then um, um, in comes now he's just above the water line the well off of course are well above the water but i mean that's where you know that because they're saying we're going to make tough decisions and that will include with you know on vat and probably they're rich they're well off so we are doing something but at the end of the day if you ask for example pensioners eligible for pension credit who don't get it eight hundred thousand of them they're getting their winter fuel payment taken and, and, and some of them make twelve thousand pounds a line. year yeah some, I, I have a little another little story when, when the man at the top is fearful, things change. Like, tell a story about Alistair, Alistair Darling, who I, another great person I have huge respect to, much missed. And he told me this story about the fact that RBS had failed. Um, and he was told it. And, and the question he had, I mean, he was told, it. he was sitting in a meeting in, in Paris, and they came to him and said, the Royal Bank of Scotland, the largest bank in the world, and the world didn't know this for two years. And he was faced with the reality of should he rescue the bank? And he said to the advisors, he told me this story on air. I got him to tell, I was, I interviewed him on the, on the television. And he said, I, I asked what the options were. And he, they said to him, well, there's a significant option, possibility that if you don't rescue RBS tomorrow, every credit card in the world will stop working. And he said on air, he said, I couldn't, I couldn't face that possibility. I have children, he said. I have, I, I have a family. I have responsibilities to my family and my kids. And even if that prospect was tiny, for my family, I couldn't do that. So there's, that's sort of the story, right? The story is if it's, if, it's, if it's potentially calamitous, think of COVID, think of the Great Recession. You do things when everybody is involved in this. And in a sense, the way this is going to have to work is everybody is involved in this. Um, everybody needs to take ownership of the fact that, and I think the, the really good way to think of it is everybody is in on this because they can't get to a doctor. They can't get to a GP. 
the fun the system isn't functioning and that's harming people and so so the answer to this is rachel and Kier, everybody's in this together and you're going to cause the biggest disruption because people i mean the other thing is what's happened apparently i don't know if this is true you may have reported more than i've seen but apparently his his popularity ratings have plummeted because expectations expectations that things are going to be better have been i mean they the danger is that, that they've been smashed and what's going to happen is things are going to be worse but the moral of the tale as an economist who i could work out how to fund it i think about the economics i think about what the central banks are doing i write a lot about that is it doesn't have to be this way so the well, people should stand happen. up today it does not have to be this way you don't have to do these cuts you don't have to make people worse off and if you can't do it get out of the way and we'll find somebody else who can so that's why i've changed my mind i think that's, that's why i'm it's... here that's why i'm shouting out and speaking out and saying oh my god i gotta go talk to owen jones again but that's, that's how desperate and we know <laughs> things are desperate when that happens but, I, i'm but... pretty desperate but let's finish on what are we going to do about the well-being of the woman on the mile end road omnibus and owen jones and danny blasher are on that and, on the, and the well-being of that woman is like the story that that alistair told it's everybody's auntie, um, auntie, daughter, friend, cousin. They, they, everybody's in on this. And they can't let this group think inanity. They can't allow this choice to be second rate, third rate, fourth rate to happen. And it doesn't have to be that way. How'd I do? Perfect. And I think just to end, amen. Tragically, I think you may well end up being vindicated, but not in the way that you like or would like what to be. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is I think what they will do is stick to their current course. Yeah, I think so too. But we are, just, I mean, I'm on it. I'm going to jump up and down. I'm going to make good. it so bloody hard for them. I'm going to try and get people to stand up and say, and remember, remember what happened in 1927. People aren't necessarily going to be compliant. They're not necessarily going to be compliant. No. And I think just to wrap up, just so, because we want everyone to share this video. It's very important that we share what Danny said. Get the message out. Share it to people, particularly people on the fence, perhaps people who think they don't have an alternative, they don't have a choice. Listen to Danny. He's vindicated before. He will be vindicated again, I think, in the worst possible way. But people can build pressure. We can get the ideas out there, get people to organize and put pressure on these people. As he notes, they're a lot weaker than they look. Uh, Keir Starmer's rating has gone down by 27 points between July and August. He's now minus 16. He was already the most unpopular leader of the opposition to ever win a general election since records began. And he's sinking like a stone. How are things going to be right. in the winter? And, and every, people... Time the people, every time he goes into public, say, well, what are you doing about the well-being of the woman on the mummy bus? What are you doing about ordinary people? Hmm. How does my auntie get a hip operation? Why are you cut heating allowance to my auntie? Who can't heat her house? It's on you. It's on you. What are you doing about this? Why you're a Labour government? You're not. You're not. You're not Osborne. Why are you doing this? You don't well, have to do this. It's a well, choice. But... It's a choice that you've decided to hurt the people who supported you and voted for you. Get off it. And that's a brilliant way to end it. It is a choice. Please like and subscribe. Do leave your comments, thoughts. Do uh, share this video. Get the message out. But please, a big thank you to Danny. Thank you so much, Danny. <laughs> Great. <laughs>